Good morning, good morning, good morning. I want to welcome each and every one of you to what we call St. Paul Online. We're certainly delighted and elated that you're able to join us on this day, wherever you are right now. If you're on Facebook, YouTube, on our Zoom congregation, you're watching us. As far as our website is concerned, I want you to do me a favor. If you could give God praise in your virtual space. And for those that are in the house, if you will, let's give God praise. Amen. Amen. It's Children's Day. It's Children's Day, and our children are going to be leading the worship uh, on today, and I'm very excited about uh, what God is going to do with them and through them. Uh, I just want to give some instructions uh, before I have Peyton to come and present whoever is going to be doing what part as far as the worship experience is concerned. If you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or engaging in our live chat room found on our website, we want to welcome you to what we call St. Paul Online. Digital ministers and social media influencers are ready to engage you this morning. So real quick, we want you to share this experience with others. If you're on Facebook, share on your personal timeline without starting a separate watch party. We want to stay in the same chat stream, and you can also tag people you want to invite to this post. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel and text the link of this worship service to your personal network. We want to get our uh, YouTube channel subscription up to at least 1,500. And if you're in the chat room on our church website, we want you to click the invite button in your chat window and share this experience with others. And as you're doing that, uh, we want to know where you all are. So if you would, just in your um, space, uh, type the city and state where you're watching us from as far as today's gathering is concerned. So I want you to do me this favor, if you will, put your hands together as I minister to our children and youth come, uh, Reverend Peyton C., to share how we're going to flow this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor. I really appreciate it, man. Uh, good morning to all of you, and uh, man, welcome, man. And it's children's, uh, it's children's Day here this morning. It is Children's Day, amen. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the part, man, this is the Sunday that where I get to have a lot of the kids come and be a part of our service this morning. And so, man, I, I'm so excited for what God is going to do in and through each of our kids. Um, I, each one of them were selected because, man, they all represent something awesome here at the St. Paul Children's Ministry. They've been very active in Sunday morning live and uh, were handpicked by Reverend Richardson and I um, because, man, I knew they were going to do a really good job with this stuff. So I'm really excited for them. I know each one of them are going to knock it out of the park. You guys got to realize I haven't seen some of these kids in, in a while, man, and, and they've grown on me uh, so a foot each, I swear. But, uh, man, it's going to be good. Um, and I'm so excited for what God is going to do through them this morning. So please put your hands together. Uh, Isaac Eason is going to come and he is going to introduce us uh, to worship this morning through our call to worship. Amen. Good morning, St. Paul. My name is Isaac Eason, and I just finished the fifth grade. Today is Children's Day, everyone. If you're excited as I am, put your hands together and give God praise for this awesome day. I'm loving being back in the church for worship today. Regardless where you're worshiping from this morning, give thanks to God that you woke up another day. It's another chance to tell someone what about his love that never ends and his faithfulness which lasts forever and ever. Today in worship, kids like me will be helping out with parts of our worship service this morning. Following our opening hymn, Aiden will read the scripture and Carla will say our, op our prayer of invocation. Now please join our choir in singing our opening hymn, The Comforter Has Come.
Good morning. My name is Aiden Lawley. I am in second grade. Our scripture today is Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. That is why the Lord says, Turn to me now. Well, there is time. Give me your heart. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Don't tell your clothing and your grief, but tell your heart instead. Return to your Lord, your God, for there, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relate, relent and not punish. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Bow your heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day, the blood you shed for us, your grace, love, and mercy. We thank you for food and shelter and cars and ways to travel. Please come into this place and strengthen all of us with your words and your power. Thank you for waking us all up for another day to live and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise at this time. As we come today, and we, of course, want to thank God for our children, for how they have blessed us in a tremendous and a mighty way. Do me a favor, wherever you are, can you put your hands together and give God praise for them? Amen. Amen. Thanks to our worship leaders, our scripture reader, as well as our prayer. We greatly appreciate the gifts that the Lord has here at St. Paul Church through our children, and that's something we do not take for granted. We do not take that for granted. I want to, uh, as we move forward as far as today's worship experience, I have several observations I want to share with you all. As far as our time is concerned, uh, first of all, as part of our social justice ministry uh, that is providing resources for our incarcerated brothers and sisters, we've established a partnership that's allowing for us to, even at this moment, simulcast into the Mecklenburg County Detention Center. And so we have access to an estimation of about 1,500 of our brothers and sisters who eventually will come home for a fresh start to continue to be productive citizens. We want to welcome them to our simulcast at this time. Let's give God praise for them. Amen, amen. We're going to be recognizing graduates uh, on the, the fourth Sunday of this month from high school, uh, from community college. Uh, from undergrad and grad, uh, grad school. If you are graduating this year, you can notify the church office so you can be recognized by going to stpaulbaptist.church slash grad. The deadline submissions is today. Those who register by uh, the deadline will be recognized during our graduation recognition worship service on June the 27th, 2021. Our guest preacher will be Reverend Dr. Brianna K. Parker, who is the CEO and founding curator of Black Millennial Cafe. For those persons who register, we're going to be sending out invitations for you and your immediate household, your immediate household, your immediate household to join us in worship on that day. You're going to be prompted to register the Monday after Father's Day through email uh, that you've listed on your graduation recognition form. And if you have not received the confirmation email, check your spam or junk folder. And if not, then resubmit a new form. Today, between 1 and 3, hopefully and preferably weather permitting, uh, our academic resource ministry will sponsor an end-of-the-year school, uh, end-of-the-year drive-through celebration for our pre-K through 11th graders. And we want to celebrate and cheer on our St. Paul children as they have ended a challenging year due to COVID. And yet, the Lord allowed for them to be promoted to move on to the next grade, and we want to celebrate and commemorate them. Amen. Amen. Just want to let you all know that work and ministry continue to go on here at St. Paul Church. The Debt-Free Life Group will gather to learn and discuss behaviors, tools, and scriptures that will help us identify our financial vulnerabilities and break free from the oppression of debt. It's going to be an interactive Bible study that's going to strengthen your ability to become a better financial steward. And so uh, our leader for that is going to be Minister Erica Miner. The dates are going to be June the 15th, that's starting this week, due July the 13th on Tuesday evenings from 6.30 p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. You can register today by going to stpaulbaptist.church slash smallgroups. Also, if you are a high school graduate, college student, or a recent college graduate who wants to be prosperous and debt-free, we have just the thing for you, our debt-free life group will be hosting to be Young, Gifted, and Debt-Free Financial Fitness, a five-week course for college-age individuals. Our facilitator is going to be Sister Briella Nelson. The dates are going to be starting this week, June the 15th through th July the 13th on Tuesday evenings from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. The cost is only $10, $10 making an investment into your own financial well-being, $10 for study materials, and you can register at stpaulbaptist.church slash small groups. Um, also, to let you all know that, again, ministry continues to go forth. Our community engagement and social action ministry are teaming up to help our neighbors who are reentering the community from prison. We're going to be collecting needed items uh, for them when they uh, come from prison. And so on Saturday, uh, June the 19th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we'll be collecting items uh, via a drive-by drop-off here at the church. 
and you can bring those items so we can give them to the sheriff's department for distribution. And here's what's needed for both males and females. Uh, soap, deodorant, underclothes, all sizes, towels, and bath cloths. And if you're unable to drop off these items on this date, feel free to drop them off at the church during the business hours. And for more information, contact Reverend Bernie at the church office. Also, our ministry, uh, our media ministry needs you. Of course, we are in the process now of continuing to expanding and uh, adding on as far as our media ministry. And so we would love for you to join our media ministry. If you're good with cameras or worship uh, service graphics, uh, as well as serving as a technical director, we can train you uh, if you may have some ambivalence about that. But I want you to contact uh, Sister Comise Noel at C-A-M-E-S-E dot N-O-E-L at Yahoo dot com. And, of course, we'll look forward to adding you to this wonderful and to this marvelous team who really make what we do on Sunday morning work with great precision and proficiency. And so we could definitely use and need your help. Uh, before I uh, mention uh, some prayer concerns, I want to do uh, a couple of other things. Uh, for those who uh, have been a part of St. Paul for a, no a long time, many of you all remembered uh, Mother Hamilton. Mother Hamilton uh, on today is turning 105 years old. And I wanted to give her a special shout out. She is in the Philadelphia area, and of course, uh, uh, the Lord has been keeping her. Her mind is still sharp. Her body is still strong. We thank God for her. So uh, I just want to give you a major shout out, Mother Hamilton, and we celebrate and commemorate you turning 105 years old on today. Thank God for your uh, life. Amen. Amen. I want to... Uh, at this time, just share with you all what's going on here at the St. Paul Church as far as our potential reentry is concerned. And I'm going to go ahead and flush some things out right now. We have currently going on conversations as far as key integral uh, aspects as far as our church life is concerned. And uh, we are working together to create systems and protocols to have you to come back real soon. We have a core committee of about eight of us, and then we have an expanded committee of almost 30 people that have some integral parts in worship. So we're talking about everything from music to hospitality to first impressions to our medical team uh, to our custodial and, and facilities management, uh, the whole nine yards. And uh, our first conversation with that larger committee took place on yesterday. And uh, I heard that it was just absolutely great. A lot of ideas are coming forth. So I want to let you all know, people say, when we're going back in, when we're going back in, uh, if we continue to be in a positive trend as far as uh, 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 this variant is concerned, and of course, doing the work that we need to do, getting vaccinations up and things of that sort, we're potentially looking at coming back on the first Sunday of August the first Sunday of August. That is the date that I have set for us to try to come back in. Uh, and we're gonna be letting you all know uh, how that's gonna move along as far as that's concerned. Uh, we wanna make sure we have everything in place to welcome you back home to your sanctuary uh, and to let you know what uh, you need to do as far as that experience is concerned. So I ask that you all will bear with us for the next uh, seven weeks as we make preparations to welcome you back. And I uh, also want to put on your minds, we will be having our church conference on July the 31st. That's going to be the last Saturday of July, July the 31st. And that will be the Saturday before the Sunday we come back in. So we're going to be doing a whole lot of different things, and we are looking for you all to uh, join us, and we'll be letting you all know further information. As we move forward, as far as prayer time is concerned, um, we want to share these prayer concerns with you. The family of Justin Oliver Caldwell, the three-year-old grandson of Sister Linda Mason, his service will take place today at the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church. Visitation at one and the service will be at two. 
the family of brother Charles Davis, who is the brother of disciple Betty Oates, his services will take place tomorrow, June the 14th, at Advent Funeral and Cremation Services in Lanham, uh, Maryland. The visitation will be at 11, and the funeral will be at uh, noon. I ask that uh, we will continue to lift up these families in our prayer, the family of Brother Curtis Wood, who is the brother of Disciple Reginald Wood, the family of Sister Maddie Terry Evans, the mother of Disciple Mary Evans Campbell, uh, the family of Sister Pearl Carlos, the grandmother of Brother Disciple Terrence Minor, the family of Sister Jeffner DeSager, the sister of Disciple Robin Terry, and I ask that if you would also put on your prayer list, Pastor uh, Elder Chester Brown, who is the pastor of Mount Moriah Primitive Baptist Church, our mother church. Uh, Elder Brown's mother died, and today he and his family will be making their way to Tallahassee, Florida to uh, engage in her funeral. And so I ask that you all will put him in your prayers for traveling grace and mercies as well as uh, God giving them the strength and comfort to endure uh, this time of loss and bereavement. We want to lift up particularly for prayer as far as hospitalizations are concerned. Uh, Sister Gina Dean, uh, Gina Pettis Dean, uh, we continue to lift up our Pastor Emeritus, Reverend Dr. Paul Drummond, uh, Gloria Dixon, we continue to lift up Sister Thomasina Drummond, Sister Eloise Alexander, who had surgery several days ago. We continue to flank her with our prayers, as well as Sister Rhonda White. We want to continue to lift up Deacon Jacqueline Brown, uh, who is recovering from a mild stroke, as well as her husband, uh, Brother Anthony Brown, that's uh, providing uh, care for her right now. Uh, there are other names that are scrolling up and down your list. We continue to lift up Brother Adrian Amos, as well as others who are dealing with their own sickness and uh, long suffering. We know that God can do anything but fail. And so as we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer, we want to, at this particular time, uh, ask that you will posture yourselves as far as that moment is concerned. Let us go to uh, the throne of grace um, in prayer this morning. You bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, Lord, this morning, thanking you, God, for the ability to worship you. Um, God, you are deserving of all of our praise. Everything that we have in us, God, you are deserving of that and so much more. God, I pray, Lord, that you would be over of the, each and every one of the families that are represented, God, on the prayer list, God, that, that, that has been shared and that is scrolling, God, on our screens right now. God, I pray that you would move in such a mighty and magnificent way, God, to be able to be with those families, to comfort them, to heal them if necessary, God, to be with those that are recovering from surgery, that are looking ahead to surgery and looking at recovering and having new bodies, God, and having a fresh start um, after healing themselves from whatever sickness or whatever, whatever wound it is that they have. God, I pray that you would be the good doctor and be with them, Lord. God, I pray, God, that you would be with us, God, as, as we continue to mourn the, the uh, loss of different disciples, God, here at the church. God, help us and send us, um, God, to care for them in a way that shows you and shows your son Jesus and his love, God, to them in their hour of need. God, be the comforter that you are. We know this month and we know every month that the comforter has come, Lord. You have come into our lives and God, you are near to the broken heart and you are close to those who are crushed in spirit. We thank you, God. Wrap your loving arms around us this morning. Thank you so much for Children's Day and the beautiful kids that able, were able to come up and God represent your Holy Spirit, God, this morning and the wonderful gifts that you have given them to represent you courageously, God, in worship of you this morning. We love you so much, God. Be with us, Lord. Help us to do right by you and to glorify you in all that we do. We praise your holy name this morning and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you believe that God is moving in your prayer, can you give God praise at this particular time? Thank you, Reverend C, for lifting up those, those prayer concerns. And we know that God will answer them according to God's sovereign will. Amen. 
Amen. My brothers and my sisters, it is time for us to give. It is time for us to give. It is time for us to partner with our God as far as doing the work of reconciliation and redemption and transformation and liberation in a world that is desecrated because of our sins. And so at this particular time, as we prepare to give, I want you all to know that good work is going through here at the St. Paul Church, and it is because of your gifts and your largesse that that is a working reality. We continue to be a blessing as far as our food pantry ministry is concerned, and throughout this particular week, we served, I believe, nearly 190 families, and we thank God for that. That's because of your, your work and your giving. Uh, we continue to be a blessing, and you know that we will be blessing our brothers and sisters who will be coming out from under incarceration uh, as far as giving is concerned. Of course, as well as doing the work of renovating uh, our space here at the church and uh, doing the improvements that are necessary. So work continues to go forth. Ministry continues to go forth. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to let you all know that uh, a couple of years ago, we raised over $30,000 to build a well in Kenya. Well, guess what? They're getting ready to start construction on that well, even as I speak right now. So we give God praise for that. Your work made that a work in reality. I heard from uh, our executive secretary of Lock Carey, uh, Reverend Emmett Dunn, sent me a text saying that they're beginning to start the work this week. So we thank God for that, and I'm looking forward to seeing that project come to fruition. As you prepare to give, your giving uh, continues to make the work in the ministry here at St. Paul um, a reality. And as you give, there are three ways you can give. First, you can either drop off your cash, check, or money order here at the church. Just call the church. Make sure someone is here to receive your offering at 704-334-5309. Or you can mail your check or money order to the church at 1401 Allen Street, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. Or you can go to our church website and through either ACS or Church Life, you can give as far as that's concerned electronically. And then you can also give through the app called Givelify. You can download that app to your smart device, uh, connect it to your Frederick credit card, and in three clicks, you can give. And so as we prepare to give right now, I want you to, for just a moment, just take about 15 seconds to just think about what you want to give in thanks and celebration to our God. And as you prepare to give, we're getting ready to lift up our gifts to the Lord so that we can give and we can bless our offering. So if you would, take your offering. We want you to place it in your right hand. We want to give God what's right, not what's left. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. I see you all on our Zoom congregation. That is so cool. All heads bowed. God, we come and we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to partner with you as far as giving is concerned. It is something we don't take lightly. Thank you, God, for allowing us through the hands, through the labor of our hands, to be able to earn and to give. And as we give, God, we don't do it grudgingly or out of necessity, but cheerfully. Why? Because you love the cheerful giver. So, God, if you would, take these gifts, multiply them in a god way so that we can continue to be a witness as far as the work of ministry is concerned and mission to your community. It is in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray, and in his name we claim it done. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Go ahead and give, and I ask as our uh, music ministry comes that you will celebrate and engage in worship. And pray for our preacher, Reverend Peyton C., who will be blessing us with the word today.
Amen. He is still the light. He is still the light of the world. Amen. I pray that pray that you all are doing well this morning and that you are enjoying the uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful celebration that we have going on right now of our Lord and Savior, who is the light of the world and deserving of all of our praise uh, this morning. And before we begin, you mind if we go ahead and pray as we get started? I'd like to center ourselves as we get ready for this preaching moment. Dear Lord, thank you so much, God, uh, just for uh, just a beautiful day to worship you. God, I pray that you would speak through me right now. God, let, let, let my imperfections and my pride, God, be in the shadow of your glory, in the shadow of your cross, God. Move in a mighty way. Speak um, from my lips and let the words that come from my mouth be pleasing in your eyes, God, and in your heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I begin, guys, I just want to say a big thank you uh, to each of the kids that represented uh, us today very, very well. Very well, amen. They, they were fantastic. I was blown away at how each of them did. So parents, thank you for working with them, taking the time to help them out through that. And kids, you, got, you guys did great, man. I really appreciate you guys. It's so good to see you all. I know I was joking earlier with many of you that you have grown. And I, I, man, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to see what time has passed since I've last seen you. But it's good to see you all here this morning. I also told, uh, I told Mela, Cedric, and Matthew I'd shout them out uh, this morning um, in today's worship service. I got to talk with them all yesterday. They're normally kids I see during Thursday night, uh, TNT, and I got to talk with them yesterday, and it was so good to hear their voice. So I know you guys are watching right now, Mela, Cedric, and Matthew, and I love you guys too. Uh, let me say to my grandma who watches every one of my impact moments in this sermon right now, I, I'm almost acting like I'm on TV right now. But thank you, Grandma, man. I love you so much. And uh, to the family that I know is watching or will be watching later, I love you guys, and I miss you all very much. Lastly, I want to say uh, two big thank yous. Uh, one to Pastor uh, for giving me the wonderful privilege uh, to speak this morning. This is not something I take for granted because, man, I've heard some amazing preachers in my time here at St. Paul, um, and I, I know that this, this pulpit is something to take seriously, and so I really appreciate that, Pastor, a lot. I also want to say thank you to uh, my friend and my brother, uh, the Reverend Dr. Marco McNeil Sr., um, for helping me get my mind right and get this topic figured out um, that I wanted to preach on for today. Thank you, brother. I love you, man. With that being said, um, I say we go ahead and let's, uh, let's get this Children's Day message rolling, shall we? If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Um, I'll be reading until the end of chapter 4, verse 11. Sounds long, I know, we're, we're, we're jumping chapters here, but I promise, I promise, it's a short passage. I'll be reading from the New International Version uh, this morning, so we'll be in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, and I'll be reading until chapter 4, verse 11. The scripture says this, and it should be on your screens, I believe, as well. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, Jonah provided a scorching east wind. God, excuse me, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? 
and also many animals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of today's message that I want to bring before you this morning is this. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? There's a quote I want to throw out there for us to think about today. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. See, guys, I wrestled with this quote, which is from the movie Just Mercy, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The movie was based off the book by defense attorney Brian Stevenson. After reading the quote several times, I wondered to myself, what is the worst thing that I've ever done? Although I feel like I could say the worst thing I've ever done and I'd still be your youth pastor at the end of the day, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that between God and I this morning, if that's all right. When I think about the worst thing I've done and to know that the God of the universe still loves me in spite of my greatest faults, man, that, my friends, is unconditional love. It's a love that I accepted into my life at a very young age growing up in a Christian family. When I first came to know God, I was convicted by the fact that I had disobeyed my parents and based off everything that I had learned in Sunday school, because of this, man, I knew that I missed the standard that God had set. You see, God is holy, he is perfect, and me, Peyton C., I'm not even close. Because I have done wrong at times in my life and have gone against God, God has every right to be angry or upset with me. But because of how great and loving God is, amen, we're already shouting, instead of his wrath, I receive his grace, and more specifically, I receive his mercy. You see, mercy Mercy is a word I hope you become even more familiar with by the end of this message. Mercy is the kindness or compassion that we are shown, that we show to those who have wronged us when it is, when it is within our power to harm, to get revenge over, to punish the people that have done us wrong or have done the wrong to someone that we love. For my kids watching right now, if you know the story of Spider-Man, then you know that when Peter Parker first became Spider-Man, he had the chance to get revenge on the criminal who murdered his Uncle Ben. But instead, he showed that same man mercy by sparing his life. He could have harmed him. He could have done something to him, but he spared his life. This is mercy for us. In my life, I would have to say I've seen God's mercy a lot in my wife, Taylor, or Tay as I call her, who, and she apparently was very happy to hear that she would be used in a positive sermon illustration this morning, amen? You see, if I can brag for a second on my wife, I will tell you all that she does a great job at seeing the best in everyone, and I mean everyone she meets. She is great at seeing people as being greater than the mistakes they've made because she has seen, that, seen what it's like for people to look down on her when she first started believing and following Jesus. Her friends and family didn't think she was serious about it. I have to say that when I first hear of someone apologizing for the things they've done and they say that they wanna make a change in their life, my first reaction is somewhat similar. It's usually, man, I sure hope it's legit. Even before that, when I hear of someone doing something wrong, my initial thoughts are, wow, I really hope they are punished or that they feel the weight of what they've done. Let me tell you this, while, while Tay was going to school at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, I remember her being really excited and telling me about the fact that Michael Vick and Ray Rice had come to speak at Liberty's convocation or the student worship that they have there on campus. A lot of people's first reactions to this, and sadly, I will admit, even mine included, was, man, what are, what the heck are a dog killer and a wife beater doing at a Christian school? Really? Our first response should be similar to the excitement my wife felt seeing two men who have done horrible things in their life stand up on stage in front of an entire Christian campus and talk about how they are looking to God to help transform their lives. This is the tension that we live in with mercy. On the one hand, we want to see people punished or face the consequences for the evil things that they have done. And to a certain extent, there's nothing wrong with that. Consequences are a part of life's mistakes and mishaps. It's okay to want justice for something evil that is done, amen? 
But the true problem lies in us looking at someone and only seeing the evil they've done and not seeing the capacity that they have to change into the wonderful creation God has purposed them to be. This is a part of the tension between justice and mercy. The other part of this tension that may make things even more uncomfortable for us is when we look at our enemies or those who have done us wrong in life and we don't want God to show them the same mercy that he's shown us. Wow, wow, the audacity for us to do that. If or when our enemies feel remorse for what they've done and they attempt to change, we may find it difficult not to feel even a bit, feel, feel even a bit angry when we see the Lord showing them kindness and compassion we feel they don't deserve. For example, a former friend couldn't get your name out of their mouth talking about you behind their back. Oh man, but you're God's anointed. That's not right. Man, or your formerly toxic ex-boo or bae comes to know Jesus and you're telling God to remember how they did you. Or a coworker does something to mess up your job performance so you wind up praying for their downfall instead of treating them with the same kindness that God has shown you. Again, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? This is the question that God has asked of Jonah in our passage for today, and it's one that I will say this morning we should be asking ourselves if we've ever been angry at God showing kindness or compassion to those who have mistreated us. When we find ourselves with condemnation on our lips, ready to pray for the downfall of someone we think has done worse than us, this is what I want for us to do. We're gonna remember who God is and how he has shown mercy to us. Again, let me repeat that because that's the main point I want us to get from today's message. We need to remember who God is and how he has shown mercy to us. I think we need a little background to get us moving through this passage properly. You see, Jonah is mad because God had compassion on the people of Nineveh who were actually enemies to Jonah's people, the Israelites. The city of Nineveh was at one point the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were a known enemy to Israel. Israel are God's chosen people, his beloved. However, because of their continued disobedience and following other gods and not worshiping the Lord alone, God had sent the Assyrians to punish Israel by sending the Israelites into exile to leave their homeland. God showing mercy to Israel's enemies is an act of betrayal not only to Jonah, but it also probably would have been an act of betrayal to all the Israelites that would have been hearing this story. You see, the book of Jonah would have been read to a large portion of the kingdom of Israel. Narratives or stories like Jonah were read to gathered communities in Israel, and they could listen to it and get a message from it that was for the community to reflect on together. If you've grown up in church, or if you've been around the Bible long enough, or even if you've heard of the man that was swallowed by the whale for disobeying God, you know something about the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He was a messenger for God, called on by God to go to the city of Nineveh with a message for those people that the city of Nineveh would be overthrown or destroyed in 40 days. Nineveh was the last place God wanted to be, but God's grace and sovereignty with the help of a boat and a three-night stay in the belly of a whale, Jonah found himself in the place that he didn't want to go. Nineveh, the place where he would share this message, this warning message that God wanted him to give to a wicked city. When the Ninevites heard this message, they believed the word of God spoken from Jonah. They took the warning seriously. All of Nineveh, including the king and the animals, even fasted, wept, and mourned the warning from Jonah. Think about that. Not just the people, the whole nation, even the animals mourned. They wept because they believed the message that God was speaking through Jonah. The king even of Nineveh had sent out a decree throughout the entire land that everyone who called upon God and would give up their sinful ways, because man, if they did this, maybe, just maybe, God would turn from his own anger and he would have compassion on their people. This is where we pick up in verse 10 of Jonah chapter three in our passage for today. God saw the actions of the Ninevites and for God, the one who knows every human heart, their actions were one of true, genuine, holistic repentance. 
Through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 18, verses seven through eight, God had spoken of the importance for any nation who truly turns to God with repentant hearts and how God would relent or change his mind about any destruction that he would bring upon that city. We've seen this truth in, our, in other parts of scripture where God has reminded us that if we come to him with broken, contrite, and repentant hearts, man, the Lord will be merciful. He will forgive our sins. He will heal our land. God saw Nineveh's action and he chose not to punish Nineveh. This isn't the first time that God had changed his mind. God can do whatever he wants to do, but when he sees authentic repentance, like any good parent, he is ready to hold back from punishment. Jonah felt so much fury, though, and anger towards God. How could God do this? How could God show mercy to enemies of his chosen people? Ironically, Jonah knew God was going to do this, you all. Jonah knew who God was. He says how he knew in verse two of chapter four while also telling us, the reader, his true intent for running away from God in the first place. He says in verse two of chapter four, isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, that is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. This verse is a creed, it's a statement of faith, and it's, it's a belief that the entire community shares about who God is, about his character. You see, the Jews believe this about their God, Yahweh, they called him in Hebrew. And this is so ironic for us, guys, because when we read this, Jonah believes all these things about God, and he thought he could thwart God's plan to show mercy to this wicked city by running away. Man, this is foolishness on full display. As a Hebrew, you see, Jonah knew God's character. He knew God's qualities. He, he and the whole community would have known who God is, yet he thought he could thwart this God's plans that was so great, so merciful, so abounding in love and powerful enough to relent from giving the punishment that he was planning to give. Man, a creed like this, it's why we sing the doxology at the end of our services in person. The more we remind ourselves of the truth about who God is, his character, it's the more we will stand on the word of God without letting what the world believes about God creep into our minds. You see, the more we remind ourselves of God's character throughout all of Scripture, in Exodus, in parts of Psalms, and in other parts of Scripture, we see that God is referred to in this same way that he is right here in the passage with Jonah. Loving, compassionate, faithful, ready to hold back from punishment. This is God's character. Again, we need to remember who God is and how he has shown mercy to us. After seeing that God's character wasn't changing for him, Jonah wishes for God to take away his life. Has that ever happened to you? It seems kind of drastic of a wish from Jonah, doesn't it? Where, where, where were you, man, when your world was falling apart into pieces around you because your image of who God is was falling to pieces? A world where God shows mercy to every nation, not just Israel, was not one Jonah felt was worth living in. The sad part is this would have been the truth for a lot of Israelites hearing this story. Y'all wanna know something crazy? This is where I nerd out. This is where I geek out over a passage like this I was telling uh, my wife. Man, you see, this, uh, man, after Jonah says it would be better for him to die than to live, the Hebrew word satuma is listed after this passage, after this verse, Satuma would indicate for the narrator reading the story to take a major pause or a break in telling the story. In other words, after hearing Jonah's death wish, the audience would have been left with pitch silence, a pause to stop, ponder, and reflect on Jonah's death wish in silence. The Israelites and us too should reflect on Jonah's frustration with the Lord, showing mercy to people we don't like and how crazy of a frustration this is. And what, what do you know? After this major pause or break, the narrator then says God's question in verse four. Let me read this again for us the way this passage should go. It says in, in the end of verse four, Jonah says, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? 
Think about this, the word of the Lord coming from silence, asking us, asking Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? That's powerful, isn't it, church? From silence, a word from the Lord and a convicting one at that. That's convicting for the Israelites hearing this story and also us too, if we've ever been that upset about God showing mercy to the enemies that we have in our lives like Jonah is right now. You see, in verse, in verse five, Jonah ends up leaving the city and this is where I think Jonah gets a bit childish in my opinion on Children's Sunday. It's like he is so stubborn to believe that God would just let Nineveh off the hook. So he goes and camps out outside the city to watch and see if God changes his mind one more time and takes Nineveh out like he was planning to do. Ironically, again, the writer of Jonah is up to some poetic justice, Pastor. Let me tell you how. The shelter Jonah builds is similar to the type of shelter the Israelites would make during a celebration of the Festival of Booths. Man, what? What is the festival of booths? I didn't hear about that one in Sunday school. I really didn't. Well, during this festival, man, the Israelites would make makeshift shelters to remind themselves of what it was like living in the wilderness and having to depend on God for everything that they needed. If only Jonah could remember the irony in that. If only Jonah could remember how God had taken care of his people in the wilderness. Ironically, he's building shelters that they would make in the wilderness while they were waiting on God, depending on him for his every, every provision for their needs. If only Jonah could remember what God had already done for Israel in the past. He was suffering from memory loss, I believe. He didn't remember Egypt. He didn't remember how God had delivered his people from slavery. He didn't remember when God used Moses to help part the Red Sea. He didn't remember when God led you into the promised land. Jonah was suffering from memory loss. St. Paul, we can't make that same mistake. We cannot. We have to remind ourselves of how God has delivered us and has brought us out of the dark places in our lives. Even if Jonah had thought about his own personal life, he would see where he wasn't even supposed to be alive. Three nights in the belly of a whale, man, God had already delivered him in many ways. If only Jonah had remembered who God was and how he had shown mercy to him. Next, it's as though God sees Jonah pouting and he wants to teach Jonah a lesson about mercy. And it's another aspect of this story that we need to pay attention to. God sends a plant to cover Jonah's head. Praise God for the revelation that he gave me when I read this back over. God sent a plant to cover Jonah's head. Well, Jonah had already made a shelter. Jonah had already made something to try to cover himself, but the shelter that he made was not adequate enough to cover his head. It was not adequate enough to protect him from the scolding hot sun rays that were beating down on him in the desert as he awaited his enemy's destruction. So Jonah, since his efforts weren't enough, God said, I'm going to make for him a leafy plant and I'm going to put it over top of his head and I'm going to protect him from these sun rays. Man, I see this in the same way that our works, our good works are not good enough. You see, God still comes in at the right time. God still comes in and delivers us because our efforts will not take us to where we need to go. Man, this is what God is doing. He has pity on Jonah by easing his discomfort, by giving him this plant for shade. This plant doesn't last long, though, because the very next day, God sends a worm to take out the plant he gave Jonah for shade. And Jonah ends up livid again. God, how could you do this? How could you take this away? Jonah plays right into the lesson that God had to teach him. Jonah's efforts were not enough. He needed God and God's kindness and compassion. He gave Jonah this plant. Jonah had done nothing to receive it. God had willed it into existence, and just like that, I'll take it out just like that in the same way mercy is not given based on our own efforts but it's given on who God is if it were based off our efforts we'd be in a different place than we would be with God on our side amen that's the truth about it we need to remember who God is and how he has shown mercy to us God ends the passage and he ends the theological conversation between Jonah and him by telling Jonah that he was more concerned about the plant than he was the people of Nineveh. My, my, my. Neither of them did he create. And sadly, the plant was who he had more compassion for. 
like Jonah, how often do we get caught up in our own inconveniences, our own circumstances, that we fail to notice the needs of those around us and how we might be able to love those people better than we have been? How often do we fail to notice the people around us and how they need Jesus the most? When we refuse to give mercy, it's because we have a selfish me attitude, just like Jonah does here, acting as if our mess stinks less than another person's. Man, in God's world, all sins are the same. I believe that. Do you this morning? Because if any one of us breaks one commandment, Scripture says we might as well be guilty of breaking it all in the eyes of a God who is perfect. Thankfully, God doesn't leave us in our brokenness, and I'm thankful for that this morning. Just like he wasn't going to leave Nineveh in theirs. You see, Jonah receives one last rhetorical question from God at the end of our passage. If mercy belongs to God and it's his to give, then why wouldn't God have compassion on the people of Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left? This description of the 120,000 strong that are represented in the city seems a little bit strange, doesn't it? I know not many of us are going around talking about those that may not believe in God saying, well, they don't know their right hand from their left. Seems to be a weird expression for us here. Well, this description, this expression would have been a cultural expression for a lack of knowledge, an expression of innocence. Basically, guys, these people of Nineveh, they did not believe. They did not hold to the same standard that we believe in as Christians, uh, being, belonging to the family of the true God of the universe. These people may have followed other gods. They have been, may have been led astray. They have, may have been thinking and just full of sin in their lives. And the truth is they didn't know whether they were sinning or not because they didn't know the truth about who God is and what he wants for their lives. The truth is if Jonah hadn't delivered that message, these people would have continued in their lack of knowledge about who God is all the way until death. And that's the truth for us this morning too. There are people right now that don't know who Jesus is, and if we don't tell them about Jesus, they'll continue in their lack of knowledge all the way up until their death. Man, when will we care about the eternal value of other people's souls? That's what God wants Jonah to do here. Don't you see these people? They don't know me. You need to go to them. That's why I'm sending you there. Jonah and us too, we're left seeing, guys, a God who loves all people even the animals in Nineveh, even the animals. I love this about God. He doesn't just love people, he loves all aspects of creation, even the animals in Nineveh. We're reminded that mercy is the kindness and compassion that God has for all people and all living things. It's not just for a particular group of people. There's no place for particularism in the church. Church isn't a select special group of people that are more loved by God than anybody else. We are all loved by him and we are called to live our lives together in community, celebrating who God is and what he's done for us. You see, scripture tells us, guys, in 2 Peter 3, 9, this wonderful truth that it's God's desire for everyone, everyone, every single person to come to the saving knowledge of knowing his love. God wants no one to perish no one to die without knowing him. And I'm thankful for that because I have family and friends that don't know God yet. And I'm praying, God, give them more time. Give them more time. Help them see the beauty and the love of Jesus. You see, guys, that's why God sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. He didn't want us to die. He didn't want us to live our lives without knowing him, without knowing his love, without knowing his mercy He sent his one and only son that whosoever believes in him, man, that he sacrificed and paid his life on the cross for the sins of the world. And that person, that person will have everlasting life. Church, we began with a question this morning. Is it right for you to be angry? And as you ponder that this afternoon and throughout your week, I want you to think about the example our savior gave while on the cross. When his enemies hurled insults at him, when they mocked him, when they beat him, when they stripped him, when they pressed his head into a crown of thorns, when they nailed him to a tree, when they stretched him high and when they strung him wide, our Savior didn't reach for revenge. He didn't let hate stir in his heart. Jesus didn't wish, like Jonah, for God to take his life. No, instead, Jesus cried out while on the cross, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Our Savior Jesus killed his enemies. The only thing that he did was with kindness. 
He told us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Mercy was Jesus's calling card. And you know what, church? I believe it should be ours this morning too. Mercy should be a part of who we are. Because when I remember who God is and how he has shown mercy to me all the days of my life, I can't help but give God the praise he deserves. I don't know about you, I was on the highway to hell. But man, because of God, because of his mercy, because of his kindness and compassion, God pointed me heavenward towards him. Amen. Amen, church. Thank you. Come on, let's give God praise for a powerful word. Oh, I think we could do a whole lot better than that. Thank you, Reverend Peyton C. for, for that wonderful proclamation. And it is a reminder of the mercy and grace of God. You preach so hard, you sweat it. Now you know, that's more than a children's meditation, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, you needed the towel, man. You needed the towel, you needed the towel. After hearing a sermon like that, I want to encourage anyone that is watching us that if you don't know who Jesus Christ is and the partner of your sin, just listening to that message should let you know that it's God's desire for everyone who hears the gospel preach, for every man, woman, boy, or girl, to have an encounter with the God of the universe. That encounter, of course, takes place by you confessing your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Unfortunately, even in 2021, with all the social media capacity that we have, some folks still do not know what's required to have a relationship with the God of the cosmos. I want to share that with you right now. After hearing that word, you ought to be uplifted and convinced that you can come to God regardless of where you are in your life, knowing that God wants to make a profound difference in your life. I want to lead you in a short prayer prayer of new life, prayer of forgiveness, a prayer of you becoming a new creation in God. And then I want to let you know what the next steps you need to take in order to make that a working reality. So if you would, wherever you are right now, just bow your heads, repeat after me. Lord, I thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I believe he died on a cross. I believe you raised him from the dead. I believe one day he's coming back. But until then, send your Holy Spirit into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Show me the mercy that you showed the city of Nineveh. I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you for the gift of eternal life. In the name of Jesus, I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, you meant that prayer in your head and your heart. You're sincere as far as that prayer is concerned. There are several things I want to share with you right now. If you prayed that prayer and you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's yours right now. If you meant it in your head and heart, your mind and your spirit, you're saved. Is it really that easy? Yes, it is. But I want you to seal the deal. I want you to seal the deal, and that's by becoming a candidate for baptism. And if you want to be baptized, this is what you all, all you need to do. If you want to be baptized, just type in salvation. If you're watching us on Facebook or on our St. Paul website, type in salvation in the chat box. One of our digital ministers is going to reach out to you let you know what the next steps are as far as that is concerned. If you're watching us on YouTube or you're listening to us on the phone, email us at connect at spbcnc.org or call the church office at 704-334-5309. Leave your name, your number, or your email address so we can reach back out to you. Someone will contact you by 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon to let you know what the next steps are. There may be someone saying, well, Pastor, I'm already saved. I know who Jesus Christ is. But you may want to become part of the family of God here at St. Paul Church. You may want to become part of our tribe. I would love to be your pastor. These men and women would love to be your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
we would love for you to partner with us and let's do life together. And so if that's you, this is what you can do. If you're watching us on Facebook or on uh, our website, just type in connect, connect in the chat box. Again, one of our digital ministers will reach out to you, let you know what the next steps are. Or if you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us on telephone, uh, email us at connect at spbcnc.org or call the church office at 704-334-5309. Leave your name and your phone number or an email address where we can reach back out to you and we'll let you know what the next steps are. We would love to do life with you. Amen. We would love to do life with you. You. Let me say that one more time. We would love to do life with you. Amen. Amen. Reverend C, thank you again for such a powerful and prolific word. The Lord really used you in a mighty way. And it's something I don't take for granted. And of course, I've seen your continued growth uh, since the time you've been here at St. Paul. And we are definitely excited about the, what the Lord is going to do with you and through you. Can you all do me one more favor? Help me to celebrate our children who led us in worship today. Listen, we're getting ready to get out of here. We're getting ready to get out of here. Uh, thanks to our music ministry, our musicians, our uh, media ministry. Thank you, Reverend Richardson, for giving assistance to Reverend Peyton C. today. Thank you to the families who have come to be with their children as far as worship is concerned. Let me put this out there for your consumption. On next Sunday is Father's Day, and I'm offering an opportunity for 100 fathers to join me in worship here in the sanctuary. We would like for you to be vaccinated, to have been vaccinated, uh, but we're looking forward to having at least 100 fathers to join us. We're gonna send out uh, a call where you can uh, either email or send in uh, your request to uh, become part of that worship experience on next Sunday. So I'm extending it to the fathers. Now let me say what I mean by fathers. I'm not talking about sisters that act like fathers. And what I mean by that is, is that there are some sisters who say, I had to be both a mother and a father to my child. No, I'm not talking about you, sweetheart. Amen. I'm talking about the fathers. If you are a father legally, biologically, or even spiritually, uh, we want to invite you to come and worship with us as far as next week is concerned. And so you should be getting more information as far as that's concerned to join us on next week. We're going to ask that if you would at this particular time, uh, wherever you are, prepare yourselves for the benediction. Those that are in the house, if you would stand as we prepare to leave from this wonderful sacred space. I'm going to ask Reverend C if he would come in his own imitable way and dismiss us with a prayer and benediction. Let us go to God. Dear Lord, thank you so much, God, for a beautiful day, God, and blessing us this morning in service and celebration, God, of who you are and what you have done for us. I pray, God, as we go out into the world, Lord, that we would think about you, that we would think about your mercy, how wonderful, how beautiful you are, God. Help us to be ready to show it to those around us, Lord. We love you. Thank you for all the ways that you love us. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Be blessed, God. Thank you so much. Amen. We'll be looking forward to your children coming to join us for our drive through between 1 and 3 o'clock today. So come on out and uh, receive the blessings that we have for you here at St. Paul Church. God bless you all. Take care.